uh, Juicy J, you know, Juicy J from the legendary group 3-6 Mafia. We're checking out his memoir, Chronicles of the Juice Man. Let's go ahead and check out uh, chapter five, and I'm going to come back with my reaction. Hit that thumbs up button, guys. 3-6 Mafia started off better than most groups. One store, Pop Tunes, called us because people would be coming in the record store looking for our mixtapes on cassette. <laughs> We worked out a deal with Pop Tunes where we'd sell them the tapes on consignment. For every sale, we'd get $3 profit. So, we'd bring 100 over there, and they'd sell out in less than an hour. Mm. We'd have to re-up like this on a regular basis. We did the same thing at custom car shops like TNT Pro Audio and Mr. Z Sound Express, <laughs> where people would go to get high-end stereos and upholstery for their rides. We were making really good money. A couple thousand here, a couple thousand there. We were able That's to good. enjoy our newfound wealth, too. We bought really nice cars and got gold rims. We were living good off the mixtapes. We were acting as our own record company, as well as our own distributor. We'd go get the tapes, print up the info, put the stickers on them, and drop them off at various stores in Memphis. Since we were selling hundreds of mixtapes weekly at Pop Tunes alone, word got out about us to one of the biggest players in the city, Selecto Hits, <coughs> a major Memphis-based regional music distribution company, reached out to Pop Tunes. That thumbs up button, guys. Thumbs up button. And that's how we got connected. They knew our mixtapes and independent projects were selling out at local record stores. When Sam Phillips launched Sun Records in 1952 in Memphis. He began his ascent in the music industry. The legendary label released early material from such black musicians as Johnny London, Joe Hill Lewis, and Willie Nix, as well as white ones such as Elvis Presley, Johnny Cash, Carl Perkins, Roy Orbison, and Jerry Lee Lewis, among others. Seven years later, Sam's brother, Tom Phillips, who had been a former manager of Lewis, founded Selecto Hits. It operated out of Sun Records' original warehouse and evolved over the years, adapting to changes in the independent music marketplace. Selecto Hits had its hands in warehousing product and helping independent labels at retail. It also acted as a one-stop, essentially a middleman between upstart record companies and record stores. One Stops would buy albums and singles from major and independent <laughs> labels and then sell the product to chain, independent, and other retail outlets in their region. When Tom stepped down in 1979, he left the business to three of his children, President Skip Phillips, Vice President Johnny Phillips, and Administrative Assistant Kathy Gordon. The business thrived under their lead. That same year, Selecto Hits found its niche, distribution. By 1986, Selecto Hits was the Mid-South distributor for such record companies as Fantasy, Malico, Alligator, Select, and Tommy Boy. Mal the only one I recognize out of all those names, those <coughs> is Tommy Boy. So I'm, 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 I believe those record labels don't exist no more because I don't recognize none of those names. The only person that I recognize out of all those names is Tommy Boy. Alico, for instance, was the initial distributor of Easy es Ruthless Records right. and its landmark 1987 single, Boys in the Hood. Oh, I didn't know that. Why? Wow. In other words, Selecto Hits was a major player in the independent music scene. Really? That was right in our backyard. Huh. Johnny Phillips wanted to meet with us. When Paul and I... That's a big deal. Let me tell y'all something, man. Back in, back when before Spotify, where you can just get your music on your phone and stuff digitally, people would buy CDs and tapes. Distrib being in a distribution game, that's a very hard uh, business to get into because they kind of keep that, you know what I'm saying, sold up. Distribution back in the day is big. Even with movies, to, dis you know, to put a movie out into theaters, you need a distributor. And that's a big deal. I went to their office. Johnny told us that his son was listening to our music. We could hardly believe it. Our music was already getting out of the hood, even in Memphis. 
During our visit, I liked Johnny's vibe. He's from Memphis and understood music. Johnny told us that he loved what we were doing and that we had developed a buzz on our own. He took us around his warehouse and showed us all the records Selecto Hits was distributing. I had no idea they were distributing Easy es material, as well as priority records of the releases. Selecto Hits was massive. I was thinking, these guys discovered Elvis. Now they want to work with 3-6 Mafia. Who knows what could happen? Mm. Given the buzz we had in the streets, Selecto Hits said we could do one of two different kinds of deals. An artist deal or a press and distribution deal, known in the industry as a P&D deal. Mm, P&D. I appreciated that Johnny respected us and wasn't trying to take over what we were doing. As I would later find out, it was rare for a successful person in the music industry to let you run your own ship and retain complete ownership of your music. Paul and I read over both deals. I also spoke about the opportunity with Project Pat, who was in jail at the time. I didn't really run all the numbers against our expectations Project because Pat. we didn't think we'd sell too many copies. <clears throat> but with the P&D deal, we knew we'd get 90% of the net profit per CD sold. That sounded promising. Plus, we wouldn't just be artists signed to somebody. We would be coming in as businessmen and owning our own label. I wanted to be like Stax, and this was a way to do it. That's dope. After Paul, Pat, and I discussed the deals, we realized we wanted to do our own thing. At first, I came up with Paul and Juicy Records. It was corny, so we ended up settling on Profit Entertainment and agreed to a P&D deal with Selecto Hits. That was the beginning of our record label and being CEOs. We were so hands-on. Paul drew the Profit Entertainment logo, and later, the one for our label, Hypnotized Minds, too. We were starting to make a name for ourselves, but we weren't at the stacks level yet. We had some money, but not crazy money. Mm. Going to the studio was expensive, so I made a critical decision. I sold my cherished Delta 88, the one with gold rims, mm. for studio time. I bought that car with the money I'd made DJing and selling my own mixtapes. I sold it for $3,000, and I bought another, cheaper Delta 88 for $1,200. Mm. A lot of people in my neighborhood thought I was going broke, <laughs> but I didn't give a fuck. I had to make the right business decision. People started talking shit about me, saying I was weird, that I didn't <laughs> fuck with them. They were right. I didn't. <laughs> More importantly, I didn't care because I was doing my own thing. That's right. My grandmother had always told me not to worry about people who weren't helping me put food on my table. That's right. That's right. That stuck in my head. Mm -hmm. Project Pat was locked up at the time, and his car. I used to always be like, I used to always think, damn, people don't like me. And then I think to myself, fuck these people, shit. They ain't helping you eat. They ain't putting no, you ain't giving me no money. They don't give a fuck. They don't know when your birthday is. Why the fuck do you care about what they care? What the fuck, what, what, what they think about you? Anybody who ain't putting no money in your pocket and helping you eat, you, know, you should give two fucks about what they think about you. For real, whoever they are, that's real shit. I ain't really like that since I got older. Woman, man, or child, you can give two fuck. You ain't helping me eat. Fuck you, shit. You ain't doing nothing for me. What the fuck do I give a fuck what, what you think about? Car was just sitting in the driveway, so he told me I could sell his car too. I sold both cars and put the money on studio time. It was the best investment I made in my life. That's when we did our first album. 1995's Mystic Styles and officially launched our own record label, Profit Entertainment. Our music had really started off hardcore and underground, and we had the riotous Break the Law 95, the robbery song, Gotta Touch Em, Part 2, and the street centered In the Game. I didn't know they was in. Around this time, we were upset with Bone Thugs and Harmony because it sounded to us. Like they were using the Memphis styles and flows from Lord Infamous and Coops to Nicka in their music. What? Bone, who was from Cleveland and backed by Easy E, broke through in 1994 with the single Thuggish Ruggish Bone and the EP Creeping on a Come Up. 
That's why we disbone on the Mystic Style song, Live By Your Rep. Lord Infamous went hard on that song. I shall take a thousand razor blades and press them in their flesh. Damn, he rapped. That's take crazy. my pitchfork out the fire, soak it in their mm-hmm. chest. We were not playing. It wasn't just Bone, though. When I heard how Biggie Smalls had sampled Mtume's Juicy Fruit song for his single, Juicy, I thought Biggie might have heard my mixtapes. The reason I thought this was because I was calling myself the notorious Juicy J on my mixtapes, even before he started calling himself the notorious B.I.G. On one of my mixtapes, I even used the Juicy Fruit beat and scratched my name, Juicy, in it too. Mm. Our music was popular in Memphis, but I knew people in other cities were hearing it too. Now, I'm not saying Biggie took anything from me, but I felt like he did. (laughs) We didn't want Mystic Styles to be all bucking. Yeah, a lot of these damn rappers, man, they be paranoid and like a motherfucker. They think everybody out to get them. <laughs> it's like, why would you want to be in the business where you think everybody out to get you? You know, that ain't fun. You know, you're supposed to be having fun and making music, making money. You think everybody out to get you. And angry, though. So we did the song, The Summer. You know, I, I'm going to stop. stop. I'm gonna start. I know y'all get tired of me stopping this shit, but check this out. I'm going to tell you why they, a lot of these people, a lot of these cats used to be drug dealers back in the day. Drug dealers don't trust nobody. So they bring, they bring that shit into the rap game. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It was a different sound, a little more laid back, and not nearly as aggressive and confrontational. Paul started off the song reflectively, talking about how we came up. We've got Ann Hines singing the chorus. Lord Infamous and Coops Danica were flowing slower. So it was easier for everyone to enjoy. I was talking about hollering at girls and the homies I grew up with. It was a different approach for us because we tried to make a song for the radio. We wanted to soothe the listener. It worked. The summer was the first 3-6 Mafia song that got some local radio play. We tried to get a label to sign us, but no one was interested. Paul and I paid our way to go to New York and met with Fab Five Freddy, who was working with Palace Records at the time. They had signed Erul and Bushwhackers, but were really making noise with Chicago rap group Crucial Conflict and their hit single, Hey. Oh, yeah. Fab Five Freddy was real cool, just like he was when he was hosting Yo! MTV oh, Raps. Oh, shit. I remember Hey. He said y'all he really remember, liked us. Y'all, oh, y'all remember Hey? Crucial, y'all remember Crucial Conflict? I think they might have had two albums back in the day. My friend Ruben bought the he bought the whole CD. I bought the single. That's back when they used to have singles on CDs. That's back when people used to buy music at the book at the. You got you used to have to go to the actual store and buy music. And I bought the actual CD. I bought the single. Hey, hey, was the shit. I used to like that song. <clears throat> and even came to Memphis to check us out in our natural element. We took him to Denim and Diamonds a legendary club in South Memphis, and had a great time. He liked our music and was feeling our vibe, but Palace was only offering artist deals, not like the P&D deal we had with Selecto Hits. We wanted more than what Palace was offering, so we didn't move forward with them. When I would happen to see 8-Ball when he was back in town, I'd tell him about Mystic Styles, how 3-6 Mafia wanted to do a song with MJG and him, and that we wanted to sign with Suave Records, too. 8-Ball and MJG were really putting Memphis on the map, and I was happy for them. But nothing happened as a result of those early conversations. Hmm. Undeterred, we poured all our energy into the momentum we had generated locally. I looked at DJ Paul and me like we were the dynamic duo. Nobody could fuck with us musically or creatively. As rappers... Everyone in 3-6 Mafia felt like their styles were different, which is why we called the album Mystic Styles. Profit Entertainment got its name playing off of the album title, too. Plus, Memphis was a dark city, and we were on some dark, scary shit. We were some vicious motherfuckers with a demonic vibe, rapping about robbery, murder, and people getting shot. 
You could hear me breathing in the background of a lot of our songs. Mm -hmm. I came up with that idea because back in the day, when somebody wanted to threaten you or spook you out over the phone, they call you and talk shit to you without identifying themselves. Other times they call and not say anything, but you could hear them breathing. Spike Lee portrayed that in his 1992 movie, Malcolm X. It was also similar oh, yeah. to Jason's signature sounds from the Friday the 13th series. I remember I did that one day, but the person I did it to called the police. <laughs> they traced the phone to my parents' place <laughs> and then went to my grandmother's house looking for me oh, since wow. I had called and threatened to kill the person. Mm. But that's what I would do. So I just added that element to my music, putting it in while I was rapping my verses. I also added stomps, which made it seem like I was coming after you. I was fascinated with that vibe, so I incorporated it into 3-6 Mafia's sound. Mm. Paul added in his elements and mixed them into the musical pot. It was an organic process. Since we were trying to build a musical movement, we also featured some of the other artists we were working with on Mystic Styles. We put Le Chat, Lil Fly, and MC Mac on the title track, and Lil Fly on... Now I'm High, Part 3. We thought we'd put together a genius-level album of reality rap, but we had no idea what Mystic Styles was going to do. 3-6 Mafia just wanted to put out an album. With the success of the summer, we felt like we were taking it to the next level. We were on CD, in record stores, and had retail muscle because of selecto hits. We felt like we were going nationwide. After that, our music started selling like crazy. Oh, really? I was in a Cats music record store one day with my friend, Big Bump. He was like, your shit is on the Billboard charts. I didn't know what a Billboard chart was. He showed me that we were number 15 with a bullet on one of the charts for new and emerging artists. I didn't know what that meant. That means you're selling some records, Big Bump told me. So I called Johnny Phillips at our distributor, Selecto Hits, asking how many records we'd sold. <laughs> they told us we'd done more than 15,000, and we were still selling. I'm adding it up in my head, like, that's 15,000 copies times 90% of net profit per CD? Oh, shit! <laughs> we finna get paid! This first taste of real success made me feel like I was on my way to becoming my version of Al Bell from Stax Records. That's dope. Paul and I started strategizing the next moves for Profit Entertainment. We looked at ourselves as legit businessmen because we were writing checks and planning a release schedule for our label. We started looking into getting our own office, our own studio. I wanted to get a building and put our name on it. Mm. Paul thought about a downside to that idea. Whenever people would find our office, They'd shoot it up because of jealousy. Damn. He was right. That's how it was in Memphis. So I abandoned that dream. Ain't that cr Damn. So <clears throat> it's funny. Young Dolph would always talk about haters in Memphis. He said Memphis had a lot of, it'd be a lot of people trying to get you if they see you popping. He always would talk about that, even in his music. I guess that's the thing. They, they got some serious haters in Memphis, huh? That's crazy. Mm, mm, mm. Haters everywhere. Something with us and jealousy. Black men be jealous of each other. That's crazy. I, it's, we don't know how to control that shit. That's weird. We ended up getting our own studio, Hypnotized Minds, in Memphis. It was located in a law office building, but we didn't put our name on the building for precautionary reasons. Mm -hmm. We also had a wrought iron door, cameras, and security upstairs and downstairs. I felt like we were really doing something, which made getting up every day and going to work easy. I felt a sense of pride in that. My dreams were coming true, which led to more dreams. I wanted to produce R&B and rock. Additionally, I wanted to produce movies. Now that I had my opportunity, I wanted to push even harder to get to the next level. I still wanted to shine, though, so I did. Every time I'd get a new car, I'd ride through the neighborhood with the windows down, hanging out the window. 
I had a brand new Lexus, and I wanted people to see me. Paul and the rest of them would get their windows tinted. I'd work too hard for this. I wanted people to see me coming around Evergreen, cruising with the seat back. People would be screaming, Jordan got a new car, every time I came through. That's why, hell, you, you, they didn't, you was a, I mean, not saying that they deserved it to to get shot at, but still, you going around doing that, and you know you live in a town with haters, what you thought was going to (laughs) happen? You know what I'm saying? I did that throughout my career. Whether I was driving my new Cadillac, Bentley, Maybach, Rolls Royce. Anyway, y'all, that is, I ain't gonna play too much of it. Y'all go check it out. Juicy J's Chronicles of the Juice Man. It's on Spotify and it's also on uh, Audible. This is pretty dope. You know, I like, I didn't know, I thought that they, I didn't know that they funded their own albums at the beginning, though. That's pretty interesting. You know what I'm saying? Taking it, selling, selling your car and taking that money and putting it towards studio time, not knowing whether the album gonna do anything. That's that's take some faith, man. A lot of people. That's why they became successful. A lot of people don't want to take that next step. You know what I'm saying? Put that. They they uh, call it putting salt in the game. Putting salt in the game. You know, a lot of people don't want to put salt in the game. You know what I'm saying? If you believe in yourself, put put some money behind it. If you really believe in yourself. Start spending some money, spending your, some of your own money, own money, advertising and all that shit. You know, if you really believe in yourself. Anyway, what y'all think? Leave your comments. Subscribe to Charles and Israel. Appreciate it, guys.